You are the foreign policy advisor to the Turkey's Prime Minister, Ahmet Davutoğlu. Oh. All right. And he asked you to write a report or a foreign policy analysis uh, for the recent council meeting. And when you're, you're explaining the situation to him, he's expecting you to answer a couple of questions. This is an extract from the council con conclusions, and I also included the conclusions in the system. So if you look at it, you, you can also look at the conclusions. But you don't have to look at everything because it's a long document. I'm not expecting you to look at the entire document trying to understand what it's all about because there are different policy areas that are uh, referring in the council meeting. So taking into consideration this the extract from here, let's. Uh, zoom. So you can read a bit better. Can you read it better? This one? Yes. So it gives you a little bit of the background, uh, saying that uh, the Council agreed to propose Jean-Claude Juncker to the European Parliament as a candidate for the President of the European Commission. In this context, it's agreed the strategic agenda of key priorities for the next five years. So they're trying to give the key priorities in the next five years. And in this, and the, uh, the key priorities, we're only focusing on, on one priority. It invited the EU institutions and the member states to fully implement these priorities in their work. The European Council defined the strategic guidelines for legislative and operational planning for the coming years within the area of freedom, security, justice, and also addressed some uh, related horizontal issues. The European Council defined the strategic guidelines for legislative and operational planning for the coming years within the area of... Iki tanesi üst üste gelmiş onu. Yani şey olmuş, repetition var. Aynı cümle iki kere repeat edilmiş. Of omit the repetition, all the dimensions of a Europe that processes its citizens and offers effective rights to people inside and outside the Union are interlinked. Success or failure in one field depends on the performance in the uh, in other fields as well as the synergies in which related policy areas. So this is an extract. You can find it in the official document itself. The reason why I, I got certain uh, sentences because I want you to focus on those sentences, but you also would use uh, the whole uh, text that is related. It's, uh, I said December demişim, bu da yanlış tabi, o yüzden sizin kafanız karıştı. Çünkü ilk önce December'ı koyacaktım, fakat December'da birazcık daha spesifik... <gülüyor> tamam, should link the Karalık ama şeydeki... E, Haziran, çünkü uh, it, the, the link so complicated, I will correct it again. But you're going to look at June because the link, uh, the June was a bit too specific about foreign policy relations. So it was not really related to the topics that we discussed. So that's why I thought it's going to be a bit more complicated because mostly it's about Ukraine. Um, and it's a bit uh, a political subject basically. So that's why I try to make it a bit more related. So this is going to change. I will just change it after we finish the class and put it, but in the, uh, it, it is the June that you will focus. And this is from the June one. Yukarıdaki de zaten Haziran şeyinden alınmış. And you, when you look at it, you have to answer these three questions, basically. As Turkey's Prime Minister, how I mean, Odavuto is asking this to you, and as the Foreign Policy Advisor, you're going to be responding back. How should I interpret the European Council presidential con conclusions with respect to members' responses to the development of furthering, in furthering the inter integration in the uh, area of freedom, security and justice? They set up a goal. So for, uh, you are supposed to look at it, what kind of a goal they set up and whether they are furthering this integration or not. So I'm expecting your analysis of the text and your own opinions as well. So not only the text itself, but what do you see uh, from this? And also, you, I would like you to uh, have a look at how did the heads of states and governments agree to act with respect to furthering integration, the freedom of uh, security and justice. So again, you have to look at the text. 
what kind of priorities they try to put set forward in that text and try to, because I don't have time as the, um, as the prime minister, I'm becoming the Wutoli here, so I don't have time trying to go and try to understand what is, what has been said in the presidential conclusions. I want you to prepare me an executive summary. That's what I want. So you have to summarize it for me. What are the priorities? What is the importance? And while you're preparing that document, I try to give you some guidelines. So these are the guidelines. And in your opinion, did they agree to move towards a stronger union with respect to these areas or not? I also, I'm asking your opinion. Uh, and how did the Council did delegate the task to the Council of the European Union and the Commission in reaching the conclusions target? So here, that's the technical bit. That's uh, when you were trying to do that, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not expecting you don't try to go and try to see how they're doing this. What I'm trying to uh, achieve here is that you should be able to give me who's responsible f uh, of what. Like how did the council set the target, the responsibilities of the council, what are the responsibilities of the commission, and what are the responsibilities in the Council of the European Union. So remember the original reason why I gave you this assignment, so that you know the differences between the council and the Council of the European Union. Because one of them is setting the target and the agenda and this and that, which you couldn't remember in the exam, and the other one is doing to a more day-to-day -day basis of the stuff. So I'm hoping that by the end of this assignment, you should be able to uh, differentiate the differences and you should be able to reflect it in your paper, uh, what you have learned. And the final, now, now what's the role of the Council in the EU, looking at the conclusions. So try to answer these three questions, basically. I mean, there are different ways of doing this. It's fine. You can just say number one and answer the question, number two, answer the question, number three, answer the question. You can do that way. Some other, uh, other students might feel that it's more comfortable just to write an essay, but in the essay you can answer all these questions. Whatever you feel comfortable, there is no set format. The only format is that it should be just five times new Roman uh, and 12 font and one and a half space. Apart from that, the rest is up to you. And write your name and number. First, I will give you a brief outline regarding the EU enlargement process before we move on the role of the EU acquis in the Turkey's accession process and how law can be used for furthering integration. I'll make the timeline again for the EU enlargement this time. <coughs> Let's have a short summary about how the EU enlargement actually happened. And we can see the development of the EU enlargement and see the evolution of the EU enlargement as well. Starting from 1957 with the Rome Treaty, the European Economic Community, as you will remember, started with six member states with the general aim of ha completing a customs union and later on establishing a common market, which original six countries were a part of the European Economic Community. This is the original six, Germany, France, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and Italy and Belgium. Those six member states were part of the European economic community in the beginning. They started with that, and due to the developments in the 1970s with the oil crisis, remember, and the economic recession that Europe and also all other oil importing countries actually experienced, it was a bit problematic. And the economic recession affected the entire Europe and mostly most of the countries that have any kind of relation with in terms of importing oil. And during that time, the European economic community realized that it needs to enlarge and include countries such as UK, which at that time was successfully and luckily able to uh, get cheap oil 
from uh, the North Sea with its big companies like BP and Shell. So it was an advantageous position for the European Economic Community to make the market a bit bigger and also include countries uh, with its Nordic enlargement, Nordic enlargement uh, and become nine. So UK, Ireland and Denmark has joined despite uh, the oil crisis and the effects of the oil crisis where the, uh, the integration was not necessarily in its most glamorous uh, years. In, remember 1960s, it was the time of the empty chair crisis too. So, in terms of its internal developments and in terms of its external developments, despite certain crises, the, the EU was still able to uh, enlarge. So in 1970s, we have uh, the other countries joining. And if we move forward, it's 1980s. <clears throat> in 1986, with the Single European Act, the EU becomes, the European Economic Community becomes European Community, and we have new member states such as Greece, Spain, and Portugal. And there are various reasons why these countries were able to join, because they had authoritarian regimes before, and they were trans, uh, were able to transform into democracies, and they were these uh, democracies were fragile democracies, and the European community thought that including those countries, European economic community actually, thought that including those countries will create stability and uh, at the same time peace in that, um, in those countries, which will help the southern part of the European community more uh, stable and more democratic. So they thought that including them in will anchor them further in the democratic traditions, so it will be better to have them in than out and help them uh, to uh, continue with their uh, democratic experience. At the same time, 1980s is the time where we start seeing the impact of globalization. So with the impact of the globalization, the EU is trying to respond to the needs of globalization as well, which meant uh, the EU is trying to expand its uh, market. And they're trying to establish the European uh, Common Market, the Single European Act, uh, which means that having access to these countries, which has formal colonies in different parts of the world, will also help uh, the European economic community as well. Why? Because as you all know, with the former colonies, the <coughs> market links, uh, global market links, will be enhanced as well uh, for the European community. So that's the political and economic uh, motivation why uh, the EU uh, um, enlarged towards the south in the 1980s. And we move a bit further, 1990s. As you all know, 1989, end of the Cold War. And in the 1990s, with the end of the Cold War, the bipolarity in the world has changed and uh, we have a new uh, international political order. The EU is also trying to, the European community also is trying to position itself with these new developments and it realizes that it's impossible to turn its back towards these developments. So that's why immediately they would like to have certain member states which, which are more like neutral countries such as Austria, Finland and Sweden to be part of the European community. So in the 90s we see another enlargement towards uh, north and the, and the, the centre of the, uh, the European continent and we see the Austria, it becomes 15, Austria, Finland and Sweden. joining. But that was not an end in the 2000s, so in 2004, 2006 and 2013 we see further enlargements and during that time the EU with TE Treaty of the European Union becomes EU itself in 1992. So uh, the Big Bang enlargement plus Romania 
and Bulgaria join in. And later in 2013, the last member state joining is Croatia. And the Big Bang enlargement, you all the 10 member states, which were former communist countries or part of the, the Soviet Union at that time joining. So there are two things that you have to look into uh, this timeline, basically. First of all, you see that the gradual increase of the member states, obviously, it is enlarging. It's the number of the member states are increasing. But at the same time, if you look at the upper part of the, the timeline, you will see that there are either internal changes within the European economic community, so it's evolving itself, so it's deepening in terms of politics, but at the same time, there are responses to the global changes. What are these global changes? The oil crisis, the globalization, the effect of globalization, the end of the Cold War, the changes in the, in the international arena, basically. So it is responsing, uh, giving responses to the changes in the world as well. I mean, we don't necessarily go into details. Obviously, it's not limited to the things that I'm uh, writing here. It's further complicated than that, but I'm trying to simplify here. So we can see that these responses also going along with the uh, expansion of the European uh, Union. And it hasn't stopped yet, and it's still going on. It's still continuing, as we all know, there are further candidate countries. And today we're going to discuss Turkey and whether or not and how Turkey is going to be joining the EU. But before going into the details, the enlargement is a natural part of the establishment of the European Economic Community. In the Rome Treaty, it says that any country, but that is European, sharing the same values as the European Economic Community can become member state. It is a very general, in that sense, definition, which means that it's not really limiting any other country not to join the EU. The only uh, criteria, or there are two criteria, basically, one of them has a geographic criteria. It says that the European country, so if you're an American, uh, if a country that is in the American continent, obviously you can't apply. Uh, but there was a country who applied to become a member of the Europe, uh, European Economic Community that wasn't in the European continent. Any, any ideas? Morocco. Morocco applied and it was declined saying that you're, in, you're an African country, you cannot apply, so you don't fulfill that criteria. So it failed uh, in its application basically. But it doesn't necessarily define the European continent. It doesn't say where Europe is, so where does Europe end? So it will be interesting to see if there are other countries who are applying, then uh, that, that, that there will be more clear definition of the, the European continent. Does Europe mean that it's the Council of Europe? Does it mean that, where does Europe end? So that's why we're still discussing certain candidate countries' status as well, because it hasn't been defined very clearly um, in terms of its geographical um, scope. But that's the general understanding. That's one, one aspect. The other part, is that it should be able to share the values uh, of the European economic community. That's also not very clear. So that's why the European uh, Union in 1993 came up with a criteria selection of how a candidate country should be able to apply or when it applies should be considered uh, for accession. It's called the Copenhagen criteria. Why they had to come up with the Copenhagen criteria is that, as you will see, usually the enlargement happened with three countries, almost. And those three countries, more or less, were similar within its, their categories. At least there is a geographical approximation or political and economic, in that sense, similarities. There are certain things in common. So being able to take those two countries and the political setting and the, uh, um, was also related to their accession as well. So if you look at the, the Big Bang expansion, though, it was just after the end of the Cold War. And these countries are more or less similar apart from Cyprus and Malta as being exceptions. Most of them are transition economies and they have transition uh, to a democracy and the democratic systems as well. So they have similarities, but for them to be able to get into the e EU, they had to have a set uh, 
set list of standards, basically. So that was necessary. So that's why the European, economy, uh, European Union had to come up with a more clear list of criteria to make sure that it is going to be objective, so it's beneficial from the candidate country side as well, so it's more objective rather than a general vagueness about the criteria. And at the same time, it should be easier for the European Union to evaluate the progress as well in terms of its, uh, their accession. So because of those two reasons, uh, they, had, they had to come up with um, the Copenhagen criteria. It also helped them to compare and contrast uh, the progress of each candidate country, because you should be able to compare and contrast uh, who is doing what and how, how close they are to become an accession country. So in order to be able to do that, they set up a framework uh, to assess, and this was done through progress reports. Every year, uh, the European Commission would be preparing a progress report for the candidate country, and in, on, uh, under different headings, they will be evaluating the progress that has been made in that particular area for the, that candidate country. So that the candidate country can see how it's been understood by the European Union and the European Commission uh, in terms of the efforts that has been made to become part of the European Union. So that's why they put it into a more set framework. So the accession evolved and the enlargement process evolved and become more technical more detailed and a bit more standardized in that, in, in that sense uh, compared to the previous enlargements. Because if you look at it, the first enlargement was less, uh, less technical in a, in a way. Or not, maybe not, that's not correct to say less technical, but it was very different than the, the enlargement that the, uh, the big bank uh, enlargement went through. And further down the line, as time passes, the EU is also changing its accession process as well, the enlargement process as well, because it's learning from its ma uh, mistakes that has been made previously, or they're learning from whatever, whatever it has worked, basically, so maybe focusing on that uh, particular aspect a bit, a bit further. It's becoming more technical, more sophisticated, and maybe more in detail, and maybe more difficult in that sense. And while it's happening, the EU is evolving as well, the EU is changing as well, new candidate countries are becoming member states, so it means that the EU is changing while the enlargement process is uh, progressing. So let's have a look in particular in the Turkey's accession to the EU. Turkey's accession to the EU has to be evaluated within the framework of the general uh, foreign policy objectives of the Republic from 1923 onwards. As you all know, uh, from 1923 onwards, uh, the newly established Republic wanted to have very close links with the West instead of the East or the, the communist threat that was seen uh, from the Soviet Union. And this has reflected in their foreign policy choices. Of the, uh, of the country. So from 1923 onwards, all the Western institutions that's been established, especially after the Second World War, Turkey became a member. Either they became a member after it's been established or uh, they were part of the, even the establishment process, including the Council of Europe, um, the Na uh, NATO, or UN, you name it. Uh, all those Western institutions, Turkey become member. So that's why when the European uh, Economic Community was established in 1957, Turkey applied uh, for an association to the European Economic Community in 1959. And in 1963, uh, an Ankara Agreement, so it's not a treaty, Antlaşma değil, Antlaşma, uh, has been signed by the, with the European Economic Community. The aim was to establish a customs union and later become a member. So the eventual aim was to become a member, but in the meantime, they were hoping to uh, have a customs union with the European Economic Community. So uh, it's in, it enters into force in 1964, so it's been uh, like 50 years. Uh, more than 50 years, nearly more than 50 years, uh, will be with the, with the Ankara Agreement. 
An additional protocol, which includes the regulations on customs union, was signed in Brussels in 1970, and it enters into force in 1971. And it had, the additional protocol had commercial adjustments entered into force with temporary agreements. So EU abolished customs duties and quantity restrictions, which were applied to the industrial products in, imported from uh, Turkey, and the textile products were kept aside. I mean, during that time in 1970s, like textile is one of the major export um, uh, sectors for, uh, for Turkey. So, I mean, you don't necessarily have to go too much into detail, but it was aimed at, the, with these five-year plans, Turkey claimed to suspend the obligations of the customs union and they, these, they were trying to approximate the customs duties. So let's say on a certain product, let's say a chair, the customs duty was let's say 8% customs duty. So over some time it was aimed at that customs duty every year, like reducing the customs duty let's say 2%, 3%. Over a certain period of time, uh, that, that customs duty will become zero. So that was the aim. So in order to protect the Turkish economy, give enough time to adjust to the needs. So it was, uh, it was hoped that Turkey will become, uh, Turkey's economy will be able to become strong enough to be able to compete with the European counterparts. But they didn't want to do it overnight. So this was giving Turkey uh, enough time to reduce the customs duty. Uh, over a certain period of time. Uh, what happens is that in 1980s, as you all know, the military coup happens. And uh, the military coup uh, had negative implications on Turkey relations. The relations uh, were uh, suspended uh, and the European Parliament asked uh, Turkey uh, to, to, to normalize its political conditions immediately. The same thing happened with Council of Europe as well. Council of Europe will also warn Turkey that it should immediately have elections, open elections take place and uh, a, a, a constitution, uh, should be, um, constitution should be accepted. And after elections took place and the constitution was accepted, the relations become normalized. But we had uh, the period that those relations uh, were not very good. And in 1987, with a political decision, Turkey applied for full membership. This full membership term is a bit problematic. I mean, it's been used quite extensively in media by politicians, uh, by even academics. But if you if you ask, like certain uh, EU law professors will argue that this term is incredibly problematic because there is no such a term as full membership because uh, there cannot be a half membership or quarter membership. I mean, if you become a member, you are becoming a member. I mean, there is no other kind of alternative of membership. I mean, in Turkey's case, Turkey signed an as association agreement, which means that it's going to become, I mean, that wasn't necessarily um, an associated member, which means that the customs union was supposed to be signed first and then get into place. And further down the line, after the customs union was implemented and was in place, that Turkey was gradually was in the road to membership. So the final goal was membership. So it's been argued that it was not necessary to apply for membership again, because that was the aim of the uh, Ankara Agreement in the first place. So whatever the reason was, at the end of the day, Turkey applied for membership in 1987, which put Turkey in a different track than the association agreement path, which was hoped to have the customs union and then membership. And then it diverted the route and we, we, we were brought to a different, in that sense, track for membership. But the... Uh, Application was not considered as very positive. There was various reasons. There were reasons from the Turkish side because of the political transition, as I mentioned, was going on in Turkey from a, uh, from a military uh, coup regime to a, a civilian democracy was taking in place. And Turkish uh, human rights record in the 1980s was not necessarily very, very positive during that time. And it was considered in a negative light by the, by the European community uh, accordingly. Also, the Turkish economy was not very strong and it was uh, criticized by the uh, European community again. And another reason was that in 1986, 
the, uh, this, with the single European Act, the EU just, the European, uh, European Community just established the common market. So they said that we just established the common market. We are trying to make the common market work. We cannot deal with the new membership. And they already had Spain, Portugal and Greece. So on one hand, they already have politically not very stable countries inside. They're not necessarily economically very strong. And they basically didn't want to deal with Turkey in addition to that. So stars and the moon and the karma coming together. I mean, Tur it was not the right time for Turkey, basically. But it's continued. So the opinion was negative, basically. Uh, but from 1987 till 1995, some other political development happened and the customs union agreement was signed between Turkey and the EU. For, so if you look at it from 1959 application, 1963 Ankara agreement and 30, 30 years down the line in 1995 in the Tansu government, um, the customs union was uh, signed. There were lots of debates during that time. Some people were thinking that all oh, wonderful uh, success story and a huge achievement. Now Turkey is in the European community, uh, European Union, sorry. Uh, and some other people were incredibly critical and they're saying that this is going to be make the Turkish economy more vulnerable. We're opening our markets. Turkey is never going to become part of the, the EU because if you're opening your market uh, anyways, that's it. That's the end. So different political views. And Turkey is the only country, I have to tell it in the parenthesis, Turkey is the only country which has a customs union before becoming a member state. So usually what happens is that you become a member state and you become part of the, um, you have the customs union and become a market. I mean, this was like a completely reverse policy. And if you look at it now, it's been nearly um, 20 years down the line. If you look at it, look at the figures, there will be still discussions whether or not this has been a beneficial thing. Some people would be saying that, yes, it's become a very positive for Turkey. It's opened its market. It's become more competitive. And because of that, there are more products, so the prices went down for the consumers and the quality went up. So it was something good for Turkey. And there are different brands now that we can have access that we couldn't previously. And also the Turkish uh, industry, which had a kind of a monopoly in certain ways, uh, will have to compete much better. And it also helped the, uh, Turkey in the sense that like the automobile industry, like there are other companies nowadays nowadays in Turkey that's been produced in Turkey and it's sold to Europe. So that kind of helped Turkey as well. So it is a still a disputable, this debatable subject matter. So um, if you look at it, as I said, from different perspectives, you will come up with different conclusions, whether or not it has been useful or not useful. But uh, the current um, negotiations that are going on between the European Union and the uh, United States with the TTIP. Anybody has heard about the TTIP, the new trade agreements that has been negotiated between US and the, uh, the EU. Uh, it will make the, that area, the North uh, Atlantic area, is one of the biggest and most competitive areas in terms of economy in the world. Uh, so imagine the US economy combining with the EU economy and the, imagine the market uh, that they're representing, it's going to be one of the biggest uh, markets in the world, basically. This is a new kind of strategy against the other, other uh, rising powers in the world, like the, in the case of India, uh, Brazil, or China, mostly China, basically. Uh, so it still uh, needs to be negotiated and still needs to be um, seen how it's going to be completed and how it's going to be implemented. But it's been argued that there is going to be a huge impact on third countries like Turkey and Turkey is going to lose from this because of different uh, preferential trade agreement, being a preferential trade agreement and Turkey is not being part of it and how Turkey is going to be included in this is going to be another big question mark that we will be able to see. But, well, at the end, 1995, we have the Customs Union Agreement and the political relations uh, continues. And it provided uh, for the, it's a, it's a, in 1996 that it came to, into effect and uh, it completed the process of Customs Union period, pro, uh, provided industrial products and manufactured agricultural goods. As you will remember, two weeks ago, there has been a presentation and then in that presentation, it's been discussed how we cannot necessarily sell milk, uh, but we can sell processed agricultural products. So it's also a contested issue in what we can sell, what can, we can buy, etc. 
let's move on. Two years down the line, the agreement has been signed. That's the Luxembourg summit. That was considered as a very negative uh, development for Turkey. Why? Because in the Luxembourg summit, Turkey was not included as uh, a candidate country uh, for the EU. And why it was important, we obviously applied for a candidate country, but you, as a, as a country that is officially by the council meeting, so it's the council meeting, again, in the council meeting you're, de you're declared as a candidate country. Uh, when you're declared as an official candidate country, so the official is important, that the EU is recognizing you that you are on the way to membership. At some point down the line, you're going to become a member state was important because the pre-accession strategy was going to start. And that pre-accession strategy was important because then you become eligible in pre-accession grants, in pre-accession funding, and also the key harmonization was supposed to start. So that's why it was very critical. But 1997, it's the time more conservative governments are in place in Europe. So uh, Turkey was not seen very positive uh, in terms of its it's an economic and political situation in one way. But on the other hand, two years ago, you already had the customs union agreement has been signed. But that was not necessarily the, the most glamorous years, uh, year for Turkey. And Turkey froze its uh, political relations with Europe until 1999. I'm skipping some details. You can look at it in more detail at home, uh, how the, the, the opinion, the progress reports, uh, including the opinions of the Commission, uh, was a bit more positive in 1988, which was reflected in 1999 in the Helsinki decisions. Because in the Helsinki decisions in 1999, Turkey becomes an official candidate country. Two years, what has changed? Politics have changed. Um, and negotiations have, have changed. And uh, the EU suddenly realizes that it would be a, a strategic mistake not to include Turkey in, uh, as a candidate country, that uh, it will lose all kind of links with Turkey at the, at the political um, area, basically. So the customs union was going to continue, but in the political relations, political area, you cannot necessarily help Turkey to reform if Turkey is not part of the EU um, accession process. And also, um, social democrat parties take office as well. So different kind of uh, negotiations behind the scene politics happen as well. UK supports Turkey's accession very much. So in 1999, it's uh, also helpful. Uh, Greece has changed a uh, <coughs> position on Turkey's uh, accession to the EU. Why the Cyprus issue becomes an EU issue. So their foreign policy objectives have changed as well. So as you can see, the bilateral relations have impact in the Turkey-EU relations. So Greece has changing the position. UK is supporting. Greece is supporting. The Cyprus issue becomes an EU issue, not only a bilateral issue between Turkey and EU. Uh, and the domestic politics within the member states are changing as well. That they are trying to push for Turkey's accession to the EU. And then the decision in 1999 becomes suddenly very positive and Turkey becomes an, um, a candidate country. And in 2000, the Secretary General for the European Union Affairs in Turkey is established. It was hoped that it's going to be a kind of an umbrella institution which will be coordinating the EU accession process. And it is going to be uh, separate from different um, ministries. So it will have a more autonomous role, like in the case of other candidate countries that will push for accession uh, for the EU and coordinate uh, the accession, basically, process. And it's now called the EU ministry, as you know. It's been bumped up to become a minister at the ministerial level. And we have a, a minister, minister who's in charge, EU minister who's in charge of the EU affairs. Previously, the first, um, the minister is also the chief negotiator, as it's called, Bash Müzakereci. Uh, so he, he, he is, uh, at this time, he, it can be she at one point. He is in charge of the, uh, of the negotiations at the same time, in addition to being a minister. The first minister was Egemen Bush, and then he was now um, replaced by uh, Volkan Bosker. Uh, Volkan Bosker is the, the current Minister for EU Affairs and the Ministry is very close by, as you all know. Um, and it's, it's expanded over time. Previously, when they first started as the EU Secretary General, they only had uh, a 
Secretary General, four Deputy Secretary Generals, and some um, manage, manager level positions, and then 20 experts and 20, how they call it, uzman uh, yardımcısı, like deputy experts, assistant experts, uh, I don't know, whatever called. called. So in total, maybe 50, 60 people were uh, in charge of the EU affairs. And over time it has expanded. Now there are like hundreds of people are working in the ministry, so it has expanded and it's like what it, it does and how it's doing it. Um, so it was from 2002 onwards. So let's have a look at the Copenhagen criteria very shortly. As you all know, I'm hoping and assuming, the Copenhagen criteria are that these are the, the criteria that it defines uh, if a country is eligible for accession uh, for the EU, it was laid down in 1993 uh, in the European Council in Copenhagen. It was stated that um, the state has to have uh, democratic governance and uh, respect for human rights and a functioning market economy and if we should be able to accept the EU acquis, EU law basically, and should be able to adopt the EU acquis before becoming a member state. There are four, I mean, the fourth one is not usually very well known. There are three criteria that is def uh, related to the candidate country, and there is one that is related to uh, the EU. The first one is the political criteria, and according to the political criteria, it said that the stability of the institutions guaranteeing democracy, the rule of law, human rights, and respect for and protection of minorities and fundamental freedoms. There's also fundamental freedoms that is included in that. Uh, so as you can see, like it's expected that mostly it is after the, tr the transition economies to tra uh, are also transitioning towards democracies as well. So they're trying to become from communist states, democratic states. So that's why the political criteria is very, very important. And it was, it's the main in that sense, criteria to, in order to open accession negotiations. So if you cannot do the political criteria, the accession negotiations wouldn't have opened either. So the first criteria is the political criteria, the most actually sensitive one. Hukuk devleti, hukukun üstünlüğü, insan haklarının ve temel özgürlüklerin korunması ve demokrasi. İlk kriter bu, demokrasi kriteri. The second one is economic criteria. The economic criteria is dealing with the existence of a functioning market economy. Not only you should have a functioning market economy, but also you should have an economy that is mature enough or competitive enough to be able to compete with the other European markets. Why? Because the EU doesn't want to deal with you if you, can, if you have an economy that fails. Your economic level should be at a certain level that you should be able to compete basically. So that's the economic criteria. The third one is the more technical criteria, which is the acquis criteria. And according to the acquis criteria, you should be able to adapt the acquis communautaire into own the legislation. Because the EU doesn't want to deal with different kind of standards and it doesn't want uh, you to be part of the system that you cannot basically um, synchronize your legislation. You, they want you to have the... Um, to have the key adopted already before becoming a member state. But even if you have done all those three categories, it's not enough. There is a criteria which is mostly spoken for Turkey, basically. It's the absorption criteria, which is the absorption capacity. The absorption capacity deals with the issues that the EU also has to consider whether or not it's ready to have another country uh, within itself. So it has to evaluate whether or not it's ready itself and it has enough absorption capacity for this enlargement to happen. In this, in this issue, especially with the Turkish case, now it's saying that after the Big Bang expansion, after the Big Bang enlargement, what happened is that because the EU has now to absorb so many member states all at one go, not like 3333 three, three, three as uh, previously happened, but now it has to absorb 10 more member states all in one go, now it's, uh, it has an enlargement fatigue. The enlargement, I mean, there are different terminology or concepts has been used to define this. Enlargement fatigue has been said, oh, we, we reached the limits of the absorption capacity, this and that. But that is related to the EU. That's the EU side that, that comes uh, in front of us time to time. So, the pre-accession strategy, as I said, happened just after 1999. 
So when you are declared officially as a candidate country, the accession strategy started. This is a strategy that is putting the accession in a legal framework, trying to provide you a roadmap map for accession. How are you going to be proceeding? What are going to be the priorities? How are you going to do that? What are the medium-term, short-term priorities? And how you should do that? How you should take steps? And what should be your guidelines in that? It is the roadmap. And how it is done is that it's not done in, by words, basically. The EU is doing it with the uh, pre-accession documents, like the Katılım Ortaklığı Belgesi in Turkish. And you can access all these uh, documents that I'm telling from the EU Ministry's website, from the Commission representation website, but I mean, the, the EU Ministry's website is very clear and open, and if you look at the related documents, it gives you the list, both in Turkish and English, so it's very easily accessible if you want to look in more in details uh, for that. <coughs> Oh, so that's another thing that I have to say that uh, it is necessary to note that the gradual adoption of the acquis by the candidate countries is not a straightforward or smooth process. So you can give the same kind of guidelines more or less and say that this is the acquis you have to adopt and if you have 10 member states it doesn't mean that it's going to be very straightforward. We're talking about 10 different countries and 10 different political systems, 10 different legal systems, 10 different political priorities. So the pace of accession the speed of accession and the scope of accession can be different from one country to the other. And it's up to the EU to be able to evaluate whether or not certain countries are progressing uh, in a certain way. That's why the progress reports that the Commission that is preparing each year is very important. So that's why from, uh, from the Big Bang expansion onwards, that we have a more technical accession process. That's why it's more detailed nowadays, more technical, a bit more complicated and maybe more difficult for the candidate country. But the EU tried to do it as simply as possible for itself and to be able to evaluate it much better because now it's the first time that for they had 12 member states, which was very different in certain ways from each other, trying to join. So they tried to ac assess uh, the progress in a more uniform way and was done in a more, in that sense, legal framework. And this legal framework is done through kind of a, like a legal dialogue between the candidate country and the European Union itself. So adoption of the EU legislation does not necessarily guarantee this uniform adoption by different candidate states or effective adaptation and implementation. So that's, that, what does that mean? which means that one thing that you accept at the legislation and there is another thing that how you're going to be able to adopt it or not or how you're going to implement it. You might adopt the legislation but you might not be able to implement it very effectively. These are two completely different things. And how, uh, <clears throat> how does the accession process start then? The negotiation starts. Negotiations from neg if when the negotiation starts, the accession process starts. Between being an official candidate country, being declared as an official candidate country, and the accession negotiation start, in, the, uh, in between time is called the pre-accession period. Katılım öncesi. Müzakereler başlamasından itibaren katılım süreci başlıyor. Müzakereler açılmadığı sürece katılım öncesi dönemdesiniz. Ona göre de uygulanan işte e, parasal yardımdı, hibeydi vesaireydi de ona göre oluyor. Katı, müzakereler başladıktan sonra başka bir, yani you level up. You, you, in that sense, you go to a different kind of stage that you continue in terms of your eligibility for certain uh, funds, etc. And the pace of accession was also different. And for your accession process to start, for your negotiations to start, as I said, you should be able to have the check from the political criteria. So you, you should be able to fulfill the political criteria. Who's going to decide whether or not you're going to be fulfilling the uh, political criteria? Who's the authority? Sorry? Council, the European Member States, uh, are, the, uh, are the legal authority to be able to confirm that, yes, you've done your homework, basically. And how are they going to decide on that decision? It's through the Commission. The Commission will write a report saying that this candidate country has proceeded with its accession, with the political criteria, this and that. So they are the ones who are going to be giving you your scorecard. Karneyi verecek olan aslında komisyon, konseyde karar veriyor. Evet, açılsın, açılmasın diye. 
That happened with Turkey too. If you look at it from 1999 onwards till 2005, Turkey passed lots of harmonization packages from its parliament. Abolition of the death penalty, trying to have a better rights in terms of freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, like in terms of protection of minority rights, human rights, etc., uh, etc. Et that period was, for certain people, is considered as the era, like the golden era, in terms of Europeanization, uh, in terms of adopting so many legislation, and from 1999 till 2002, it was the coalition government too. We have a coalition government till 2002. It was also very politically sensitive issues, like abolition of the death penalty, where Abdullah Ejelan was in Imbrala. Uh, so that, that was a very politically sensitive uh, period as well. But till 2005, there has been lots of uh, uh, harmonization packages that passed from the parliament. The reason why it's called the harmonization packages because as there is different topics that was very politically sensitive, it was easier to put them in like in a package and then discuss as a package in the parliament and pass. Otherwise, it would have never happened. Basically, it would have been long negotiations, long discussions, and maybe not too much result. So that's why they were put in harmonization packages. And by 2005, the Commission was convinced. In 2004, basically, the Commission was convinced that Turkey was in the line for uh, uh, uh, accession, doing the right things to become a member. Lots of reform packages has passed. And so in 2004, the report was very positive by the, uh, the Commission saying that in 2005, it is possible to uh, uh, open the accession negotiations for Turkey. And that's what happened. In 2005, the decision was that Turkey should start accession negotiations. So that's how accession negotiations started in 2005. And in certain ways, Turkey argued that these reform packages would probably have passed in the parliament despite the impact of the EU, even if the EU process didn't happen. But it's inevitable that we should consider that the, the reason why these packages passed so quickly because of the motivation of the EU. There was a goal, there was a deadline, there was an aim basically. So it became like a facilitator or catalyst for reforms as we call it. So we cannot deny the impact. And the accession negotiations starts in 2005. Shall we give a break? <laughs>